So now we're gonna look at some of the properties of the GMM estimator, both to see why the GMM estimator might be a, a desirable estimator to, to, to use, and also to help us understand, uh, like I said, what that optimal weighting matrix might be, which we'll, we'll ultimately talk about in the next video. So if some assumptions about our empirical moments and our weighting matrix hold, then the GMM estimator is both consistent and asymptotically normal. There's one property missing from this list that we might really want, and that is efficient. If we remember back to the maximum likelihood estimator, we said that it achieved the cremer rao lower bound and was efficient among all consistent estimators. That's not generally going to be the case with the GMM estimator. The intuition is basically that when we make that distributional assumption about maximum likelihood or about our data in order to use maximum likelihood estimation, that's kind of like giving our estimation procedure some extra information that's going to allow it to be, be, you know, kind of be more precisely estimated. And when we don't give it that information with GMM, we're going to not necessarily achieve that same level of efficiency. So there is a trade-off here. Uh, GMM allows for weaker assumptions about our data, but as a result, we might get uh, kind of less efficient, get a less efficient estimator. But consistency and asymptotic normality are great, uh, great properties as well, and so we're going to talk about those in this video. But first, let's talk about these conditions that have to hold. We have five conditions that have to hold, and as we talk through them, I just want to note we're gonna see a zero subscript showing up on things. Theta sub zero is gonna be our true parameter values. And everything else that has a zero subscript is going to just kind of reference the fact that we're thinking about them being evaluated or applying at those true parameter values. So that's just kind of a notational note there. So the first thing is that the empirical moments uh, obey the law of large numbers. So as we get more and more data, they will converge in probability to zero. We think they equal, we want them to equal zero, so it's good that you know, they need to converge to zero. Uh, the derivatives of the empirical moments also must con converge, just converge to some, uh, converge to some kind of matrix here. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be zero or anything like that, like in the previous assumption. Then the third assumption is that the empirical moments must obey the central limit theorem. So uh, the distribution of these empirical moments must converge to a normal mean zero with this uh, asymptotic variant or with this variance here, uh, which is defined here. I don't wanna go into the details here too much. Just I want you to be aware that there are some conditions here that have to hold. Um, and most of the kind of moments we will want to use and will encounter in any kind of research will, will apply here, but it's just use, useful to kind of point out these things. So those are three, uh, three conditions on the empirical moments. Also this fourth one here that's kind of based on the, or that's based on the empirical moment says that the, the parameters must be identified. In other words, if uh, two sets of parameters yield the same sample moments, then those parameters must be equal to one another. If we have two distinct, two unique sets of parameters yielding the same sample moments, then our model will not be identified. We'll, we won't be able to find a unique set of parameters if there are multiples out there that could get us to, uh, to our estimator or to our, our minimized uh, sample moments. And then the last condition is just that that weighting matrix, that capital W matrix that we've talked about as being important but, but not talked about enough yet. That thing has to converge to a finite symmetric positive definite matrix. So, um, you know, we saw in that last example, uh, we could have constructed our weighting matrix as a function of our data. If we do that, we just need to make sure that as we get more and more data, it's converging. Like I said, in any reasonable case, all of these things are going to hold. Um, and the reason they need to hold is just uh, we need to use these properties of the moments or the weighting matrix as we work through the proofs to get to these properties. Now, I'm not going to talk through the proofs in, in these videos. I'll refer you to a, a kind of graduate level econometrics textbook if you want to take a look at the proofs. Uh, uh, the green 
Green Book is a good one, but there are lots of others out there that you could use to, to take a look at the proofs. Um, I think just knowing that the proofs hold and what the properties are are going to be most relevant to, 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 to most applied researchers. So. so the two properties here, once again, consistency. So our GMM estimator, theta hat, is a consistent estimator of the true parameter values theta zero. Or to say that differently, as our sample size grows to infinity, basically, the GMM estimator becomes vanishingly close to the true parameter values. So that's kind of like the lowest bar that we want to uh, have for an estimator, right? If it's not getting us consistent estimates, then um, we might wonder why, why it's a useful estimator. And then the second property is that the GMM estimator is asymptotically normal with a mean of theta zero, those true parameter values, and this known asymptotic variance. And by known here, I mean it, it, it has an expression that we could write down. It's a big complicated expression, but it has an expression nonetheless. And here we're defining what each one of these pieces, the G sub O, the W sub O, and the S sub O mean. So those are kind of the two, two basic properties that are really useful. Obviously consistency and then asymptotic normality where we could at least know what the asymptotic variance is. That, that, that's a useful property to have if we want to make any kind of statement about our, our standard errors and the inference of our parameters. So with those properties in mind, now we're going to be able to talk about how to choose the optimal weighting matrix and ultimately achieve the optimal GMM estimator. And we will do that in the next video.